And I'd now like to introduce our last speaker for the session. Uh, we have John Waller from GBIF in Denmark, who will talk to us about outlier detection at GBIF using DB scan. So John, would you like to take over sharing your screen? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'll just share my screen now. Okay, hopefully it is in full screen and everyone can see that. Um, uh, yes, let's make sure. I'm... Okay, so I am John Waller and uh, I'm a data analyst at uh, GBIF. Uh, and uh, so at GBIF, we get a lot of user feedback. So one day a user writes into us and writes the following statement. The other day, I tried to find a tree, this tree, and it was not successful. It might have been there once, but it all indicates that it was either dead or not there anymore. I checked on the property and I could not find the tree. Also, the owner of the property didn't know about it, suggesting like a deletion. Height of the point is 1,700 meters. Does it occur there anyway? Okay, so here's a real life user going out into the real world and they're looking for a real tree that they believe should be there. But unfortunately, this user doesn't know that they were looking for this tree at the country centroid of Costa Rica. So anyone familiar with uh, geocoding uh, specimens would know that often uh, a curator will put, if they don't know exactly where it is, they'll put it at the centroid of the country. So this poor user would never have found the tree in that area. So this is just an example that data quality has, occurrence data quality has real world effects. Uh, so at GBIF, we try to control this somehow by letting users know when something might not be what they would typically expect. The classic one is a zero coordinate. So this would be a flag that we would put on the data saying, hey, this is at zero, zero. Seems very unlikely that this is actually where uh, this occurrence is located on the, the Earth. Uh, another one that we do is something called country coordinate mismatch. So all of these orange records on the screen are uh, say that they occur in Japan, so that they say that they occur in the country of Japan, but obviously they're outside of what most people would consider the uh, boundaries of Japan, including the like international waters of Japan. So that's something that we automatically already flag at GBIF. Okay, so one thing that we don't yet flag, but which is a very common problem, are outliers. So in this talk, I'll be mostly referring to distance-based outliers. So points, occurrence points that are not close to other occurrence points. They're kind of far away. So of course, outliers can be errors, they can be coordinates with high uncertainty, or they can be just simply records from an undersampled region. So they're not necessarily mistakes, but it still might be something that people would want to flag. Okay, so this is a typical user experience at GBIF. So you will go to GBIF and you will type in your like species of interest, and then you will uh, this case, it's a vascular plant, and then you will go over and look at the map. And on the map, you will see a nice cluster of points where the, usually where the native range of the thing that you're looking for is. And then uh, also on the map, you might see these three little sort of outlier points, these points that don't really make sense. And for most users, these points are kind of undesirable, or at least they need to be inspected uh, more closely are looked at. They might not necessarily be wrong. These might actually be, uh, or not wrong in a sense, but they might actually be like real occurrences that the user wants to use in their project, but they would still have to check them out anyway. Um, okay, so if you were working with just that one species, you would probably just draw a box around that big clump of points and then maybe look at those other three points manually and just call it a day. But if you had more than a thousand species or a hundred species, you wouldn't want to do this process manually. So is there some way that we could automate this for the user, this type of simple grouping things that are close together type uh, process? Uh, 
Uh, and so one algorithm that we could use is uh, DB scan. So it's very popular. It's an out of the box algorithm and it's simple to understand. Hopefully you can see this animation on your screens, how it's working. But in any case, it just takes two parameters. You take the distance to other points and then you take the minimum number of points that you want in your cluster. And then everything else outside of that would be noise. So this, hopefully you can see my mouse, but these three little points down here by the pause button would be considered noise under these parameter settings. Uh, so this is something simple, it's easy to understand, uh, and hopefully it would accomplish sort of the same thing as what a user might do of drawing a box around the big cluster of points. Okay, and so this is just the name of the algorithm. It's a density-based algorithm for discovering clusters in large spatial databases with noise. So it's the noise part that we're concerned about. So those would be our outliers. So it's the ones that don't fit into a big cluster, which would be the noise points. So those would be our outliers. Okay, so we can run this DB scan algorithm on that previous vascular plant example I showed you earlier. And this is the result we get. So the green points are not outliers, they're not noise points, and the orange ones are uh, outliers according to the algorithm. And there was a third point which I excluded from this run because it was marked as a living specimen. So I didn't put any living specimens into this uh, run. And so those two points happen to actually be probably undesirable points for most users of GBIT data. So it, one was a botanical garden in Denver, Colorado, and two was at a herbarium in Norway. So these are probably not naturally occurring uh, points. And I also didn't include any points here that filled in their establishment means column. So these are points that probably need to fill in like a living specimen or establishment means. And it's probably undesirable for most users to have these in their uh, data. Okay, so, uh, so I was able to run this algorithm on all plants, animals, and fungi in under an hour on the current GBIF cluster. For this run, I set it at like 1500 kilometers and I set min points to three. So it's kind of hard to tune these things, but that seemed pretty fair. So basically what this is saying is I considered you an outlier if your cluster was smaller than three points and you were in the nearest closest point to your cluster was less than 1500 kilometers. There's some restrictions here in terms of the implementation. So I was only able to run it on if you had less than 30,000 unique lat lawn points. And as I mentioned before, I took out any points that was a fossil or had your a living specimen or had your establishment means column filled in. Okay, so we can look at some more examples. This is just another vascular plant, I think. So here's another example we can see DB scan successfully sort of flags the two points that I think most users would be like, hey, I need to check out these two points. And I went and looked at them and they, I think they're vascular plants within private gardens. So it's probably something that a user would want to have their attention drawn to, especially if they had downloaded many, many species and didn't really have time to verify this manually. Okay, here's another example. So this one's a bit closer to the main cluster of points. Uh, you can see it flagged, and this one actually is like at a botanical garden again. I think this is a vascular plant as well. Uh, so here's an John. Thank you. Uh, so here's an example where we're able to get two separate clusters and then one suspicious point in Japan. So I couldn't really find anything that was at looking at the record in Japan. I couldn't find anything that was very like a unfit in the sense that being a naturally occurring uh, plant there, but uh, it's something that you most users would want to flag. And here G, uh, DBSCAN has this desirable property that we are putting, getting two clusters, which is very common. You'll have something in North America and something in Europe, and it, it's very nice to have this clustering so we can uh, just get the true noise points. Okay, and here's one final example. This is sort of, a, of course, it doesn't always work perfectly. So if your uh, thing that you're interested in happens to occur in the ocean, or if it's on an island, or it's very sparsely sampled, like it's 
very common to be in these sampling event data sets, then dbSCAN won't do well for these type of occurrences. Uh, dbSCAN will tend to fail with these sort of poorly sampled uh, species. So, so it's not perfect. Uh, okay, so if we just look at the data sets uh, uh, that have the most outliers using this type of method, uh, iNaturalist actually comes out of the top. Uh, you might start to worry that you are personally contributing to this high number of outlier points somehow with your iNaturalist observations. Uh, but I think this is simply because iNaturalist uh, actually gives a lot of data to GBIF. It's a very large data set. So if we actually look at the percentage, iNaturalist has less than 1% of its actual records that make it onto GBIF are outliers. And uh, this, uh, not surprisingly, this uh, scuba diving citizen science data set is uh, coming out as the top data set with the most outliers, which wouldn't be a surprise because you're having to ID uh, fish or something underwater, which is probably quite difficult, especially as a citizen scientist. So it seems to produce reasonable results. Okay, so um, these are the advantages. It's uh, simple, uh, it's easy to understand, it scales okay. Um, it, uh, the drawbacks is it only uses a uh, distance, but you can know like environmental settings. So you might be flagging stuff in these like poorly sampled regions. Uh, and it's sensitive, this is sparse global sense sampling. So if you had one insect that was, for example, uh, sampled by eyeball, like all over the world, then it would flag a bunch of points uh, in those. So that's sort of drawback to this method. Uh, and so finally, uh, this isn't yet implemented at GBIF. It's sort of a work in progress. Uh, GBIF has never done a multi-record issue. So we have no way to, like there's no infrastructure present to deal with these yet. Uh, we might have to re-index twice to add these sort of multi-record issues. Uh, and something like range maps uh, might actually accomplish the same thing, but with less sort of complexity. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that's it for my presentation. Uh, I will take questions now and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, John. Um, and we do have um, a question in the chat, um, which is how, how would we pre prevent removal of outliers which represent an, uh, an adventive occurrence, as botanists would call it, and which might be the starting point of an invasion, which could be highly relevant? Uh, yes, so I think at GBIF, if we were to ever get to the point of implementing this on the website officially, it would be existing as a flag. So it would be something that would not be uh, removed by default in any way. I think that would probably be what would happen. So it would be uh, a flag and then you could decide whether you thought it was a, a, a good point or a bad point, depending on your criteria of good and bad for your occurrences. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, next question from the chat. Can you use DB scan for the for genetic distances? Uh, perhaps you could. <laughs> I actually <laughs> don't think I'm qualified to answer that question, but I think you could. I think you could. Uh, and another question. Uh, isn't it isn't this isn't DB a thing? Jörg, you can um, come off mute and ask it yourself if, I'm not, if I don't ask correctly. Isn't it something that could be done after ingestion on all occurrences, not on single data sets after, after ingestion? Uh, yes, so this is something that we're kind of actively discussing now. So um, the, the idea would be that you would need all of GBIF in order to do this properly. So you would want you would want all the data sets to inform whether it was an outlier. So this adds some complications. So uh, it's, if you had a change in one data set, this would affect like all of the data sets. It's not an impossible problem to solve. There's probably ways where you would, uh, at some points your outlier data would be sort of 
out of date, but it's 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 possible that to do this where you are informed by all the data sets in GBIF to decide whether something is an outlier. Is that answering yep. the question? Hopefully. That's great. Yep. Um, We've got a couple of hands raised, but I'm going to ask one more question from the chat and then I'll come to the two people with hands raised. Um, does GBIF correct coordinate uncertainty of observations flagged as coordinate rounded automatically? Uh, so the coordinate rounded flag, someone from GBIF is on the call can uh, chime in if I get this definition wrong, but the coordinate rounded is where it's a flag telling users that uh, their coordinate has too many decimal points basically. So they've given us 10 decimal points and we've rounded it to six. So that's all it really means. So we've rounded the decimals down to places down to six. I think it's six decimal places. So that's what that flag is saying. There's a new uh, blog post that should be coming out in a few days where we sort of give the definitions for all these various issues because we realized that in the past we haven't really uh, been good about documenting what all these little issues and flags actually mean. So we have two hands up um, and then um, Matthias, I'll come back to your question. Um, Nina, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? And then Arthur will come to you after that. Hi, John. I've noticed myself uh, on the <laughs> second place uh, among uh, high percentage on your last graph and uh, fungal records of Northern Siberia database. Uh, I, I should look uh, closer, but uh, probably it is because we had many regional centroids uh, for occurrences like uh, checklists from the regions. Could that be the reason? Um, yes, I noticed the your this uh, fungal from Siberia. And I really, really think that almost all of those are false positives in a way, as much as a, an outlier can be a false positive in the sense that your data set is probably one of the only data sets from Siberia publishing these rare fungal records. So it's just going to become, just gonna be far away from other points. So in that way, uh, yeah, this type of false positive is something that it uh, would be bad because would be a bad result of this type of things if people started to trust it too much and weren't uh, reviewing these false positives. So I'm really, I don't think that uh, you should worry too much about these, uh, your data set coming up high on the, and I hope that no one else uh, thought that just because your data set was on this graph <laughs> meant that there's so a lot of problems or that it will start being filtered from yes. GBIF. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think I looked at a few of your records. And, uh, yeah, I looked at a few of your records and they didn't seem, it seemed to be a very much a false positive type situation. Yeah, um, yeah and that's true for probably like iNaturalist as well. Um, although I do notice sometimes there seems to be like some automatic species identifier bots active on iNaturalist. So some of those could be true, like suspicious uh, IDs, but they also have a, a lot of those will be false positives because maybe they sample regions from a, like an, a remote region that just doesn't happen to have a lot of points nearby, basically. So yeah, so this is a problem with this is that you won't always get back uh, things that are like truly suspicious in a way that's like a herbarium or a zoo or something like that, you know. Thank you. Um, so we'll have Arthur's question, then I'll come back to the chat questions. And then there's quite a few questions also in the document. So um, uh, you're not off the hook yet, John. Okay. Arthur, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? Certainly, thanks, Lila. Um, John, that's that was very interesting. And, and I like uh, DB Span. It'd be interesting to do some playing with it to look at, look at it. A couple of points. One, um, it's important to point out that all it is identifying is suspect records and not necessarily errors, uh, partly because um, um, you're not only, you're only using part data sets. The second one there where you talk about using the whole of GBIF versus individual data sets, 
uh, a lot of individual data sets will only be um, covering one particular area. For example, it might be a Jap Japanese data set. So you're only looking at the Japanese data rather than the total data. And they may have records from other areas that other data sets might bring, bring in. Um, it'd be interesting to know how many, uh, what the lower end of number of records you could look at. We, when we played with reverse jackknifing on a similar basis, only using latitude and longitude and not uh, environmental layers, we could get down to about four or five uh, records sometimes and identify outliers. Now, it would also give you some false readings as well. But I'm interested in, in I'd like to play with this, this one sometime. It looks good. Uh, yeah, thanks, Arthur, for your comments. Uh, yeah, just a clarification is all of the like example outliers I was showing in this talk was done uh, on all of GBIF data. So for this example, I so if you have a species key and it has a, a point from my naturalist, a point from eBird, a point from some museum data set, that was all included in determining whether it's an outlier in all the little examples I was showing. I was just mentioning that it uh, was a a problem for implementing in GBIF at scale because this runs in about an hour or something like that. So you could imagine that every time a GBIF data set updated, we would have to go back and run this. So it has some limitations in that way. So we would have to run this over and over again to keep the data up to date. So that would be the limitation. But if you run it in one hour, you get all the outliers according to the Data sets. And uh, as far as the re reverse jackknifing uh, comment, uh, that's also something that we're looking into to try to scale that out at GBIF a little bit. That's in early stages still. But yeah, that's also, that might, a combination of the two might be perfect because we would probably, Nina's uh, fungal data set would be uh, not an environmental outlier, would be a distance outlier. So you would have some more information there. So we'd say, okay, this is probably, all these fungal points are probably not too suspicious. Uh, something that is fine, basically. So following on from that, um, Matthias um, asked, how would one get rid of this flag if the outlier is actually a correct observation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, so if you're a publisher, yeah, that's, so that's something that we have to think about before we you know, start to implement this. If you're a publisher, it might be very annoying. If you're, for example, Nina, and you're, you know that all your points are not outliers, how do you get rid of this? I think that's something we have to discuss and think about if we were to implement something like that, because I can imagine as a publisher, it's very annoying. You'd have to stick another point nearby <laughs> that would be the hack way, but obviously there needs to be a more, uh, like there needs to be a system in place to like get rid of these flags somehow. Yes. So over to the document, questions in the document. Um, Nikki Nicholson asks, in coordinate checking, do you, ch do you check for digital transpositions? Um, digit rather, digit transpositions. So that is uh, where you've got mistyped hand transcribed values. Yes, if, if I understand the question correctly, I believe, I believe that we do that. So we do this if you have a, if it's a negated longitude or latitude, but it should, what we do is if, I, let me, if, you're, if your point is in China, it says it's in China, but and we flip the coordinates and it is it ends up being back in China, then we say, okay, this is a coordinate that has presumed negated longitude or latitude. So hopefully that makes sense. So we flip those back and we give it a flag if we've done that. If it says it's in a country and if we flipped them, it would end up being back in that country. So hopefully that's what Nikki was asking. Um. So Nikki, I, I think it's Nikki adding, um, I meant typing, say, if it was 78 rather than 87. Uh, oh, I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't think we do that, actually. No. I, I, someone from GBIF could chime in if they're on the call, but I don't think that we do that. That would be a nice, that could be a nice flag. 
um, they're typing still at the moment. So this check would be, and comment, this check would be expensive, so could only do it for the more significant digits. Quentin asks, can you also uh, run this same sort of check for temporal clustering to account for phonology? I think you could. I'm not sure. That would be, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. It might work. Not sure though. I think it could, it could work to think about that. Thank you, Quentin. Um, Gavin asks, uh, how to, uh, no, we've already answered that one. El Elspeth um, asks, would it be reasonable to use this with less than 30 specimens for a species? Uh, yes, as Arthur was saying, it could still work. I just, this was just an, a number that I picked. So it hasn't really been uh, explored properly. So it could work. It could work with fewer if you had a really low uh, this was just something that I picked that would work uh, generally for this type of big run uh, if you were trying to do all of GBIF occurrences. So it's just a, it's a guess, it's an estimate, like a guess basically about uh, what would work. And I, ha I had a question that was along similar lines, but um, not for number of species, but if you wanted to do it, uh, run DB scan for a smaller geographic area, could you reduce the um, the outlier distance? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you could do that. So I picked a really big distance because basically I was um, trying to develop a system where you could run this on everything. And uh, yeah, it would basically, if you have a panda in the ocean uh, or something like that, that it would flag these type of records automatically for you without too much extra work. And I think that's sort of the level that GBIF would want to stay at because otherwise we start getting into uh, issues of over flagging people's data. But as a personal user, if you wanted to use this like in Australia, you obviously would tune down that distance or something like that. So yeah, I, it's definitely possible to do that. But from a GBIF perspective, I think that we wouldn't want to tune it down too much because we would want this to be a a panda in the ocean detector rather than a, <laughs> it should be in one province or another type decisions. Um, it, it, in the Atlas of Living Australia, uh, we often have, we often do find um, not pandas in the ocean, but we do find koalas in the ocean quite frequently. Um, plenty, of, there's actually um, a number of uh, koalas that regularly swim off the east coast of Japan, uh, which is a funny place to find a koala. <laughs> Um, we also had a question which has been answered in the chat, but I'll ask it again. Uh, was that user feedback really from a real world user? That's so heartwarming to see someone is using GBIF like that. I think that was in reference to your tree, the tree at the start. Um, yes, that is a real user feedback is a very sad story. Um, that I think they may have been looking for that tree to, because I think that's a Brazilian nut someone who knows about trees more, but I think it was a Brazilian nut. So they may have just been there for their own personal gain in terms of getting a Brazilian nut. But yes, that was a real user who was looking for a tree at a country centroid. It was very sad when we read that user feedback that they had gone so far to find this tree that wasn't there. Yes, to, to have actually traveled there and not find it. Um, <laughs> is, that's, uh, very disappointing. Um, I would like to open up the discussion if people have questions on um, uh, any to, to any that they've uh, subsequently thought of to any of the uh, uh, our speakers today, please put them, um, but maybe put them into the chat rather than and also copy them into the document because I might miss them if they're just going into the document. Um, uh, Guillaume, you, you should go back into the document at some stage because Rich has written us an essay in the document uh, to explain what he was trying to describe. So um, that's some uh, good, very good follow up for you. And I'm not even going to try, I'm certainly not going to write, try and read it out because there are tables and uh, lots of, lots of information. So 
Uh, would anyone like to come off mute? And uh, Guillaume, did you have you have had have you been able to look quickly at Richard's? Um, and would you like to say anything to him? Uh, yeah, I just I'm looking at it actually. Um, when I set up Excel format for the Darwin Core, I had two two options. One was to have a separate sheet for events, occurrence, and uh, measurement, and I put a fourth uh, way to to write all the data that I called all in one, and I could put in the same table the event, the occurrence, and the measurement using only two variables, the, the ID, the event, the not the event, but the record ID, and the parent record ID. That breaks the star schema. But using these two elements, I could record all the event and the nested event, all the nested occurrence, and all the nested measurements. So it just implies to break the star schema. Uh, thank you. Rich responds in the chat that it, um, it was mostly a thought experiment, can be easily ignored or discarded, uh, and then acknowledges, right, it does break the star schema and says thank you. Is there any, there, there's a bit of discussion in the chat about um, poor koalas being found off the coast of Japan, and I agree that yes, if somebody went to try and find those, they would also be uh, not only rather wet, but rather disappointed as well. Uh, Quentin also comments that not many people can say that they've been to the centre of Costa Rica. Um, so um, we don't, uh, unusually, William Ulate is not on the call, I don't think. Um, otherwise, he would no doubt jump in and tell us how beautiful the centre of um, Costa Rica is for anyone who would like to go there. Uh, does anyone else have any more comments that they would like to make? Please feel free to come off mute um, and you can raise your hand if you wish. Quentin, you can do, would you like to do your advertisement um, in person rather than yes. in the chat? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I imagine a lot of the people on, on this call weren't at the business meeting last night because it went on very late. Um, but I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that this time of year we have the Tadwig elections and we elect half of the executive each year. Um, and at the moment, the secretary position is open. The chair of the functional subcommittee for communications and outreach, uh, the functional subcommittee for funding and partnership and the representatives for Africa, Asia, North America and Europe. So being part of the Tadwig Exec is a great way to learn about biodiversity informatics. You meet lots of lovely people. Um, you get involved in all sorts of things. You don't need to be particularly technical. There's a really wide range of jobs that need doing. Um, so I do encourage all of you to think about whether uh, you would like to do it. Um, you won't regret it, I assure you. Quentin, also the vice chair is open. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes, of course. The vice chair. So each. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Each uh, position is for two years, except for the vice chair who will become the chair after two years. Um, and so that position is actually for four years. So thank I you put a link into the chat for the details on that and the deadline for submission of nominations is the 16th of November. But if, if you're thinking about it, even slightly, just get in touch with somebody on the executive and talk to them about it and they can tell you what it's all about. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, we're all very approachable. Um, so um, please do come and talk to us if you would like to. Uh, any last questions? We're starting to get um, uh, thanks and goodbye messages in the chat. So um, if we don't have any, please let me know if I have missed your question um, because uh, the Google Doc has been very um, busy and active. Um, thank you very much, Paula, for uh, transcribing, the, um, uh, transcribing the answers to the questions in real time. That was really fantastic. Um, and thank you to everybody for putting in your questions. Um, 
one last call out, otherwise I might give you six minutes back in your day. No more, no more from anybody? Okay, in that case, um, I'd like you to uh, join me virtually to, um, to say thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, for um, presenting today and um, uh, coming to share your thoughts and uh, your work with us. It's very much appreciated. Um, uh, and uh, thank you very much to Quentin and Paula for being technical helpers today. Um, that was really terrific. Uh, the, uh, what we have found is that a Zoom conference takes a lot of behind the scenes work and a lot of behind the scenes help. Um, so it's um, much appreciated to have um, helpers here with us on the session tonight. Uh, well, tonight for me, good morning to everybody who, for whom it is the, the morning or the middle of the day. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And with that, we will close the session and um, I wish you all a very uh, excellent rest of your conference for the sessions that are coming up. Okay, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>